she runs a demonstration site at Atkinson Elementary, and she has some great stories to share. So, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm going to give you just a second to read this quote that's up behind me on the screen. I want to talk about this because as a person who teaches third grade, this is a quote that haunts me every single day. And I think about this often because I can't quite understand how they can predict that a child who cannot read in third grade will one day be in prison. But that's a statistic and that's something that they found to be true. And so I want to share with you today some of the ways that we at Atkinson are creating a solution to this problem because we are taking some of the most struggling students in this entire city and we are making them successful and we are helping them to reach grade level by third grade because we do not want this to be their future. Uh, one thing that we do at Atkinson, the first thing I want to talk about is encircling the whole child because we know at Atkinson that our kids come to us with a lot of barriers and a lot of obstacles. At Atkinson, we have about 95% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. They are coming to us from the 13th poorest zip code in the entire United States. So these are kids that are living in very extreme poverty. Um, they have, a lot of them have a very rough home life. They might have family members that are in prison. Uh, their family members do not have a lot of education. Um, many of our students' families have not been to college. I have a little girl in my class this year whose mother dropped out of school in the eighth grade, and that's not the first time that I've had a parent that has only had a middle school education. So our students come to us with obstacles. These obstacles are coming at them in every direction. And one thing that we do is we, we are aware of that, and we're not naive to that fact, and we know that these kids might need a little bit more. So we do everything we can at Atkinson to encircle the whole child. Because I teach in a demonstration site class, I work with kids who are all reading below grade level. And every six weeks, there's a whole team of us, the demonstration site team, that meets together and we talk about these kids. We lay each kid out on the table one at a time, all of their data, everything we know about that child, and there's an entire team of people at that table, and we talk about what is holding them back. Why are they not succeeding? What is it that we need to do for them? And all these people help to eliminate all the barriers in that child's life. So the school nurse is there. If that child needs glasses, she will help get them for them. If we think that child has a hearing problem, she will set up a screening. She will do whatever that child needs. If they have some other health-related issues, she's there to address that. The principal is there. Our counselor is there. And we talk to them about, does this child need counseling in school or outside of school? We talk about other problems that they might know about the child. Our Family Resource Center coordinator is there, and she talks about the child's home life. So if there's something going on at home, she's kind of our connection between the home and the school. So she can go and talk to the family, do a home visit, address some of the family issues. If that, if that family needs food, she will get it for them. If that family needs clothing, she will get it for them. If they need some kind of outside support from a community organization, she will help hook them up with that support even if that is something as simple as tutoring. When our doors close at the end of the school day, she will help find a place where that child can go to get extra support. Um, our other demonstration site teachers are there. So people that have taught these kids in the past or former teachers that know these children can talk about things that they tried with the child and what worked and what didn't or what they know about that child. So all this wide variety of people is coming together and we're encircling that child and giving that child everything that they need. And so all these people are helping to knock down all these barriers so when the child comes into my classroom, I can focus on just teaching them because I know that all their other needs have been met. Another thing that we do to encircle the whole child is our college-bound culture. At Atkinson, we have a signature partnership with the University of Louisville and the University of Louisville president, Dr. Ramsey, has come into our school. He has come to our community meetings. He's talked to all of our children. Everyone knows him as the university president. Every day when our principal leads our community meeting, she asks all the students to rise. And she always says, stand like you will when the university president announces your name on your college graduation day. So all of our kids know the university president. Another thing we have at our school are college road signs. So the kids see these every day. They know how many miles to the nearest college. And so we just promote a lot of colleges, not necessarily just the University of Louisville. 
Um, on Fridays, our kids wear these Think College Now shirts that we provided to all of our students. And then on the back, it has our school pledge. And you'll see the last line is get ready for college. And that's something that they say every day. So every day, we have a community meeting where we start our day. It's our entire student population in the gym, all of our staff members, and our principal and our student council lead that meeting. So every day, they lead us through this pledge. We also do a college cheer where every student in our school yells out the year that they're going to go to college. So we say, fifth grade, what year will you start college? And they all yell it out all the way down to kindergarten. So if you walk into Atkinson and you ask any child what year they will start college, they can tell you because we want them to envision that as part of their future. So we do that every single day. Um, another thing we do at our community meetings is on Fridays we bring in guest speakers. And so these speakers have been our principal, our teachers, um, different people in the community that our students know, um, different celebrities that have come out. And these people share their college stories. So they talk to their students about how they grew up, their struggles, their successes, the things they went through in their life, and what led them to college. And so a lot of the teachers have shared their college stories with their class or with the whole school. So on Fridays, sometimes you'll see the teachers wearing these shirts, and then sometimes we'll, we will wear our college shirts because all the students know what college we went to. Another part of our college um, culture at our school is we have University of Louisville classes actually on site. So those college students, if they're in class that morning, they come to our community meeting too because they are a part of our community as well. Right now, my third graders are working on a research paper, and the college class is working on a research paper. So we meet together once a week, and we do a lesson with all of them. So each college student is paired up with the third grader, and they work together to do research. So they're each learning from each other, and my students are seeing what a college class is actually like. Uh, next week, our fifth graders are actually coming on a field trip here to the University of Louisville and doing a tour of the college campus during the school day so they can see a college campus in action because that's something that they may have never seen before. So that college-bound culture and then helping to eliminate all those barriers in that child's life are the ways that we encircle our children and encircle the whole child at Atkinson. Another thing that we do is eliminate excuses. And I believe that this can be something as simple as one person believing in a child, and that can create an entire ripple effect. And we've seen that at Atkinson. My very first year as a teacher, I taught first grade. I had this little boy who still to this day is probably touched my heart more than any student I've ever worked with. He was six years old when he came to me. He was already diagnosed with a learning disability. He could not even write his name. He could not recognize any letters, any sounds. He certainly was not reading. Had a lot of behavior problems because he knew that he was struggling in the classroom. And he also had a lot of problems in his home life. His dad was a known drug dealer. His mom was abusive. He was actually taken from his home, but only for about three weeks in the amount of time that I taught him. So he had a lot of obstacles at home and a lot of obstacles at school. And he was very negative all the time. He would always say to me, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then he would tell me, you know that I can't do that. And it would really upset me because I believed that he could do it. And I knew in my heart, somewhere deep down inside of me, that this kid had a brighter future than what everybody else thought. Because he was six years old, and people were already writing him off. They had said, he's going to be like his dad. You're going to see him on the news one day. You know where he's going to end up. And I just I could not accept that. I did not believe that about this kid. And so he always said, I can't, I can't, I can't. So one day we took two cards outside. One said I and one said can't. And we buried him into the ground. And I told him that I never wanted to hear him say those words again, that those words were buried. They were not a part of his life anymore. And I slowly started to encourage him. So every time he did anything, the smallest thing, I would say, you can do it. Look at you. You can do it. And so I saw his confidence start to grow. And he started to do things. And he was starting to read. And he was starting to write. And his family started to see it too. Because once his confidence grew in himself, I had to get his family to believe in him too. So I started sending stuff home, like show your family this. Show your family this. Tell your family that you can do this. Read this book to your family tonight. And so his family started to believe in him too. Because at the beginning of the year, I would have conversations with his family, and it was all very, very negative. They wanted to talk about his behavior. They wanted to talk about the things that he couldn't do. And I tried to be very positive with them. And it took almost an entire year 
of working with them, but by the end of the year, our conversations really did change. They were no longer about his obstacles, but they started to be about his opportunities. And his dad even said to me, I want a different life for my son than what I have for myself. And to this day, I'm still friends with that family. Um, we're still pretty close. He calls me when he gets report cards. I think for some reason he thinks that all teachers can see his report cards, so I've just never told him that I can't. <laughs> so, because his last report card, he did get a D in social studies, and he, was, he said to me, I know you're disappointed about that D I got in social studies. And I just said, I saw that. I was so disappointed. What happened? Um, <laughs> But he knows, he knows that I still believe in him. To this day, I still believe in him, and I still expect things from him. And he's a freshman in high school now, and he's promised me that when he graduates from high school, that he will invite me to his graduation. Because when he does that, he's going to be the first person in this family to ever graduate from high school. So his family also knows that I'm keeping an eye on him, too. So they will call me from time to time if they need something or they will also call me to share successful stories and things that he's doing in school. But I believe that it started, I had to believe in him, and I had to truly believe that in my heart. And then I got him to believe in himself, and then I got his family to believe in him too. And I think that's one thing that's very unique about Atkinson, is if you walk in any teacher's classroom in that school, you will see that same thing. Because every teacher that teaches in that building right now truly does believe in those kids. And we know that no matter what obstacles they're coming to us with, that they can overcome those things. And we really believe that they will go to college one day and that they will have a bright future. And it starts with us believing that. And we've gotten our kids to believe that. And we've gotten our families to believe that. And now the entire community is starting to believe that because people are starting to see the success that we've had at Atkinson and starting to wonder what we're doing and how are we taking these kids and bringing them to these high potentials. And so we are starting to eliminate excuses not just for our kids but for everyone because if we can do it with the kids at Atkinson, if we can take these kids with all these obstacles and all these struggles and if we can help them succeed, that there's no reason why every school in Jefferson County and every school in Kentucky and every school in the United States can't be doing the same thing. This is a, another part of our community meeting every morning that we share with our students. And this is a cheer that they yell out. We call it the success equation. So hard work plus resiliency plus teamwork equals success. And that's something that was illuminated in that story with that one student. And that's something that we expect from all of our students. And we teach them about resiliency. And we teach them about hard work. And we teach them about teamwork. And we use that as a way to guide them towards success and to help eliminate excuses. Another thing that I think is very important, so encircling the whole child, eliminating excuses, and then doing whatever it takes to engage each child. And just like I said about the teachers believing in the students at Atkinson, I believe that every teacher in that building really works hard to engage every single child in the classroom. You're not going to find a child that is not learning, that is not engaged in our school building, because we do whatever it takes to engage our children. When I taught, there was a little girl I taught two years ago, and she came to me as a third grader. She was reading on a kindergarten grade level. She was very angry all the time. She told me the first day of school, I hate school. And she wore this look on her face that she hated being there every day. Um, just very angry, very upset. It was very unmotivated. It was very, very hard to get her to do anything. Um, she would hardly even speak to me sometimes. She certainly did not want to read out loud because she knew she was not reading at the level of her peers. So on the meet, at the meantime, I had gotten this girl in my class, and I was also trying to start this reading dog program. And I finally got a trainer and an owner who agreed to bring their dog to my classroom for a child to read to. So I immediately thought of this child, because I did know that she liked dogs, and I also know that she didn't like to read. So I sat down and I talked with her, and I told her about this dog named Oliver. And I told her that Oliver was a dog who loved to listen to kids read, that that brought him a lot of joy, and that was what made him happy. And I asked her if she would like to read to him, and she said yes. And then I told her, I said, the neat thing about Oliver is he can't read himself. So he's not going to know if you make a mistake, and he's not going to know um, he's not going to know if you make it up. You know, you can just read whatever you want to him. He's going to have no idea. He's just going to be happy that you're reading. So this dog came in and started reading with her. And I immediately saw her start to change. Little things started to happen with her. And 
at the beginning of the year, I would take all the kids to the library once a week, and she would get so angry, like, oh, the library, like it was this awful place that I made her go to. And she started asking me on her own to go to the library. She wanted to pick out books for Oliver. And she started just doing little things in class. If I could turn something into anything to do with a dog, she would do it. One day we were doing um, main idea organizers, just your typical web with a circle and like the arms coming out. And she was not buying into this lesson. She did not want to do it. And I went over to her and I turned hers into a paw print. I just drew it like a paw print. And I told her, when you get done, you can show this to Oliver. And so she got really excited about that. And she was the first one finished in my class. And she was never the first one finished in my class. And so I just started doing little things like that. I would cut her writing paper in the shape of dog bones. I would make everything about a dog. I would give her dog books to read. And she started to make progress. And she started to like school. And she would smile. And one of her former teachers even said to me, oh my gosh, is she smiling? Because that wasn't a typical look that you saw on her face. And so she just started to grow and change. And in six months' time of working with this dog and doing these dog things, she actually made two and a half years worth of reading growth in just six months. And she's continuing to this day. She's now in fifth grade, but she's continuing to read with this dog. Um, he still comes into the school, and she still gets pulled from her class to read with him because it still motivates her. And she's even asked if he could follow her to her middle school when she goes next year. So just engaging each child no matter what it takes. So I'm not saying that everyone has to start some reading dog program or do this, but finding what it takes for each child and not giving up on anybody and doing whatever it takes to engage each child. So I believe that those are the three things that can really help unlock a student's highest potential. If you encircle the child with whatever they need, eliminate excuses in their minds and in everyone's mind who's a part of that child's life, and engage the child no matter what it takes. And I'm going to close with a quote that I have up in my classroom and I share with my kids every day from B.B. <laughs> King. The beautiful thing about learning is nobody can take it away from you. And that's one thing when you work with children in poverty. They have many things and many people and possessions taken from them in their life. And I tell them, once you learn to read and once you learn to write, that's something that no one can ever take from you. And your education can take you anywhere you want to go in your life.